there's no music if you have no body to play it with, so take care of your body first. You getting into the gym and you lifting weights and working on muscles, is it's physical therapy for the benefit of your playing. The truth is nothing works like just taking care of the simple stuff. Diet, exercise and sleep. Take care of that and you'll be fine. Join us as two musicians and fitness coaches discuss strength, wellness and fitness in relation to musicians, artists and performance. Hello and welcome back to the Tuned and Strong podcast. This is Dr. Jen Cabas May of Tuned and Toned Performance. And this is Angela McHouston of Music Strong. And um, we are joined today by a special guest, uh, Danielle Kuntz. I think I said your name right. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it's not doctor, right? Nope. Okay. Uh, so thankfully, I sure. got out of school before then. Okay. <laughs> well, um, why don't you tell us about yourself and kind of what you do and and what you're working on and how it fits in with our uh, our work here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a harpist and kind of my big mission in life is to kind of bring new music to life. Um, so I work with composers, just realize it's a little bit more fun to play music that people haven't played to death, um, for the lack of a better, better term. Um, so that's a lot of what I do, just learning new music, helping composers just hear their music and you know everything that goes along with that. Um, but I also love what you all are doing with um, the music and fitness because I got into fitness kind of toward the end of college. Um, beyond just running, I hate running, but um, got into like weightlifting, mountain biking, lived in Utah for a couple of years. And that's just like brought so much sanity into my life. Um, just having that routine outside of just music and sitting behind a harp for six hours a day. So there's so much I could talk about that, but the way it kind of relates to the new music stuff, um, I wanted to go ahead and throw this out there is writing idiomatically is so important to avoiding injury as a performer. And you would be surprised how much music in the standard rep actually isn't idiomatic um, for harp specifically I've gotten tendonitis so many times by playing things that were piano transcriptions for harp. So that's kind of part of my mission. Um, with you know new music and working with performers who are trying to start working with composers is just understanding what works for their instruments. So, and for those who don't shield. know, for those who don't know, can you describe what idiomatic means? It's the buzzword that we all throw around. Um, but basically, in relation to harp, it's like writing something that you know works within the capabilities of the instrument. Um, there's probably a better definition out there. Mm -hmm. You're not a transcription instrument, in other words. You are a harpist, not a harp player who plays piano music. Basically, essentially, yes. Got it. Yeah. 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 And and I think most of us who've been around for a while too have kind of run into that where I mean, I've played a number of pieces. Um, my undergrad was at Arizona State, so a lot of new music going on out there and you know, working on these pieces, and I'm like, you composer were not a clarinetist. No, you were not. Yeah. <laughs> like I can tell. <laughs> I can tell this but is not it's impressive though. Like <laughs> they can write for so many instruments. They play mm -hmm. a couple of them, but I'm just like, that blows my mind. It's incredible, yeah. but they rely on the performers to give them that kind of feedback. Otherwise, you know, they, they don't know. So they mm -hmm. need us to give it a try, play the music, see what works and tell them, give them that feedback. Right. Yeah, absolutely. What's funny is on the flute side, we actually tend to do that the opposite way. We're like, Oh, look at all this great violin stuff. We should play this. <laughs> like there's so much like I played a Bach violin like the E minor concerto sonata I forget but I'm like why is this not in my repertoire this is amazing I can play this yeah this is fantastic so like you know I mean it's it's we come from the opposite side of there's so much literature that violin and flute are pretty similar in their mm -hmm. ranges but um yeah, it's interesting how it how it can go the opposite way as well. And again, like you mentioned, like uh, composers, how they can write for these instruments that they don't play is absolutely phenomenal. It blows it's, my mind as well. It's incredible. Yeah, and like so, we we expect so much of them, and they right. do incredible work. Right, I, I wish do. I could do it. I can't. 
<laughs> so I just write on their coattails. <laughs> All good. You mentioned that uh, you mentioned something about tendonitis. Can you walk us down that road there? Yeah. Yeah. So this was during my junior year of undergrad and I was playing. Okay. So this is like a very harp specific thing. I was playing a lot of music that was very heavy in its use of the right hand fourth finger. So meaning there were lots of big chords, lots of octaves, lots of repeated mo- motion. So I ended up just really bad tendonitis, like couldn't bend my finger. It was just, it was bad. And it was partly from over practicing, partly the repertoire. I was playing just a bad combination of everything, but it's just kind of something to keep in mind. Like as you're playing music, if you're noticing you're getting tired or it's like a repetitive thing, it could be the way you're practicing. It could be your technique. It could also be the way that the music is written. There's a lot of factors. It's not, probably not only your technique necessarily. Yeah. So, and, and I'm sorry, I was writing and talking at the same time too. Um, it's nice to point out cause it doesn't sound like um, your, your tendonitis issue. It doesn't sound like it was anything beyond that. Is that correct? Yeah, it did resolve itself. Um, okay. Once I took a break and went to different repertoire. So the, yeah. I think one of the pieces I was doing that year was the Prokofiev Prelude, um, which is kind of a piano piece. It ha- just has this repetitive, you know, arpeggio, fast arpeggio in the right mm-hmm. hand with left hand melody. And very few harpists can play that as fast as it's supposed to go without developing to the nights. It's just like one of those pieces. Right. Yeah. It's and cool, it's though. just, and it's, it's great for, for our purposes too, that you're mentioning stuff like this, because it's, you're saying that in this particular piece, if you are going to play it as fast as you can, you are going to develop tendonitis, but then it's going to Probably. resolve it. That's, that's that. It's so common, but right. I'm not sure. And I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot here at all, but I'm guessing that a lot of people don't talk about, Oh yeah, that piece really messed me up. You know, like, I just, oh, I've, I've heard a lot that, of people say, you know, <laughs> it's a cool piece. I couldn't play it super well. I'm in awe of the people who can play it well. And just everyone's physique, you know, physique is different. Our strengths are different. Our you know, muscles, tendons in our hands are different. Mm. So just because one person can do something really, really well, mm-hmm. just because I can't, I have different strengths. So it's, you know, another thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Does it have to do with hand size and how far you have to reach? If you have smaller fingers, it's obviously going to be much more of a challenge than if you have longer fingers, bigger hands, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a factor. Some of it's, I think I'm an over-practicer, which is something I think, you know, exercise probably helped me a little bit with that, giving me another outlet for work. But if you're just doing a lot of just repetitive stuff mm-hmm. and the tapping you hear, if you're listening mm-hmm. to the audio is me opening and closing my hands, if you do <laughs> all of that and you're not you know, maybe using your smaller, bigger joints rather than the smaller joints, or sorry, Mm -hmm. smaller joints rather than the bigger joints, just depending on how you do it, you're gonna, you could end up with pain. Right. Just the repetitive injury. But that's apparently super normal, which is something that, you know, Angela and I have talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just part of the business, but it's it's so kept quiet, you know? Right. Um, So it's, it's interesting to me to hear you talk about as a harpist, which we haven't had on, our show before um talking about like no it's if you play this piece and you're doing it at tempo like pretty good odds <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? yeah pretty i mean good odds not necessarily but the odds are right. definitely high yeah. um yeah. they're yeah, in your favor. With a lot of our orchestra excerpts not super mm-hmm. idiomatic for the harp mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. if you're on the audition train careful yeah, that's a that's an excellent point there. So I didn't realize that about orchestral lit. So the orchestral repertoire for harp is it just it's not really I don't know, idiomatic, I guess is the better word than ergonomic, but mm-hmm. like not well suited to the harp. It's just they expect you to do it and figure it out. It depends. So we have tons of rewrites that we basically just pass down. You know, teacher to student, teacher to student. Um, So a lot of the problems we have fixed, um, which is another reason I do all this work with composers, because they're studying the original excerpts, not the version that we actually play. Um, So that's also an important thing. If you're studying harp music to learn how to write for the harp, you need to know what's actually being played. Um, Mm -hmm. But some of the excerpts are definitely more idiomatic 
than others. So like Debussy's work pretty well on the harp. Um, Fogner or Richard Strauss, not so much. The Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, which is on all the auditions, doesn't work so well. Hmm. Is that because of the, the stretching or is it just because it's just awkward or can you explain a little bit more for those of us who don't play harp? Yeah, um, for the Symphony Fantastique specifically, um, so backing up a little bit, the way that we're playing the harp, there's essentially four motions that go into playing a single note on the harp. You have to place your finger on the string, you press just to get that contact with the string, you play, and then you have to, you know, after you do that closing motion, you replace again on the string. So there's four motions rather than, you know, piano, it's really just a drop motion. So if you're playing something that you can't place multiple notes together, you're having to redo that motion really fast and you're not giving your hand a lot of time to be able to relax between all this motion that you have going on. So if you're playing notes that are more sequential, like arpeggios, which everyone's like, arpeggios are so overdone on the harp, they work really well for a very big reason is because you can place multiple fingers at the same time and then combine all of those elements. So you place four fingers, you press four fingers, then you can individually play those fingers and then replace together. So you're able to combine those motions to be able to play something fast. Um, so with the Symphony Fantastique, um, the way that it patterns work, it's like an alternating note. So I can't sing, so I'm not going to try to sing it, but going like, you know, down, up, down, up, down, up, back and forth, you're having to really do these awkward figurations mm. all the way through the harp, which you're going to be tight and it just, it doesn't flow well. Again, practice, all this stuff, it does help. So it's not like it's impossible, but mm -hmm. it's not one of the better written harp parts. It was also, this is another factor, the harps that that was written for were much smaller, strings were closer together, the tension was lighter. So the harp is one of the later evolved instruments in its modern form. So a lot of the music, if you're looking at rep from the 19th century, early 20th century was written for a very different instrument. So all this fast stuff would have been a lot easier. So there's so many factors to think about in this, but we're all still playing that rep, trying to play it as fast as they did back then. Yeah. And I just, I, I find the fascination here with the harp. It's just, it, I feel like it, it transcends whatever instrument you play because who doesn't love the harp? I mean, mm -hmm. like, are you a human if you don't love the sound of the harp? Like everybody loves it. But then again, you say like, it's been, you know, the, the new form of it is relatively new. Literally. Right. But then we, we think like, as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, but David played the harp in the Bible back in like BC, what not or other. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. But then he wasn't playing that one that's sitting behind you. He was probably on a little harp, like a lyre, like a, like a harp, like harp. Right. Lap <laughs> harp is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm exactly. to say at the same time. <laughs> but he, yeah, no, it's crazy. It's like one of the oldest instruments, but also one of the newest instruments. So it's, it's changed so much in the past, like 200 years. Mm. So what is it that you're doing with with uh, composers right now? You mentioned that you're, you're dealing yeah. with composers and helping them, right? Yeah. So I do a lot of consulting on, you know, just like working with composers. So if they're writing a project, they are adding a heart part to a piece or they wanted to write a solo or just something like that. Um, I do it a couple of different ways, but usually they'll send me the score. I will go through it. I'll mark it up for them. I'll send them a little video with, you know, some tips on, Hey, this works really well. This is how it sounds. This doesn't work so well, but here's some ideas. Here's why, because that's the important thing. Um, and then here's some ideas on what you could do. There's usually multiple solutions. Um, and then my favorite thing, I just, I love being able to play new music because, you know, all of the standard rep, there's so many recordings out there. If someone wants to hear the WC dances, they can find hundreds of videos on YouTube, hundreds of recordings, most of them better than I probably can do. Um, not necessarily, but there's, you know, just there's so many options. I'm not bringing anything new to an audience, but when I can bring new music, um, even if it's not avant-garde, it could be very neoclassical. That's, that's fine. It's more just like bringing a new experience. So that's really what spurs my work with composers is just, you know, we're creating something new. And, you know, just pioneering the harp. We're trying out new things and we're actually writing music that works for 
the modern instrument as well. So things that people can continue playing that probably works better than, you know, some of the standard rep that we have. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're really talking about here too, is very much a, even in your consult work, but also in this um, sort of summit or conference, I'm, I'm not sure your word for it that you're putting mm-hmm. on. Um, it's, it's a pretty dramatic change from the modern kind of perception or what we're taught, how about that, of the relationship mm-hmm. between composer and performer, right? right. Um, a lot of people right now, a lot of what we're taught right now is, you know, well, the composer wrote this, so you're gonna play this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you don't, you don't question it, you just figure it out and you just make it happen. Um, which is um, just one second. Which is re- really interesting to me. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a head cold, so I try not to sniffle into the microphone. Um, but going back to the composer relationship, um, it's interesting that we have this kind of concept right now of like of the composer is God and you play what's written. Mm-hmm. You know, when we think back to, I know, um, clarinet history anyway, so many pieces for us, so many of the major rep pieces for us were written for a specific clarinetist because the composer had a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know? So uh, I don't know if you wanted to talk any more about that, but it is it is quite different than a lot of what's currently taught. Well, it's fascinating because especially when you know people start, you know, performers just kind of like start playing you know contemporary music and working with composers. Um, there's this fear, and I experienced this myself too, of this doesn't work, but this is what the composer wanted. So I have to find a way to make it work. And like, once I started actually talking to composers, they're so open to ideas because they're, they're learning themselves. They're experimenting, always looking to improve just like we are. We're always, you know, just because we're told to play something a certain way, we're always looking to improve. They're, they're the exact same way. So usually, I mean, I won't speak for every single composer out there, but they usually really welcome that kind of you know, collaboration with performers. So that's why I always tell performers, just talk to them. Composers love talking to people who are playing their music and yeah. So it's, it's so cool though to work with like, you know, people who are alive than just, you know, Mozart. I can't tell Mozart that his flute and harp concerto doesn't really work on the harp. Oh, kind of true. <laughs> don't tell me that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that just break my heart. Oh. The, the, the concerto in G for flute players, if I have mm-hmm. flute players here, I know you're all going to go, yeah, it's so overdone. The, the flute and harp concerto, we don't hear it hardly ever. Is this well, why? Yeah, well, you can sight read the flute part. I mean, probably. The harp part is wicked. It's, it's a beast. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you mentioned this because we, we, well, darn it. Also on the other side, like, well, on the one hand, it's like, well, can we, can, is there anything that you could do to change it? That doesn't really just, I mean, is it, is it alterable at all while still keeping the same impetus that he had or not? I mean, so we've much? done what we can. It's just kind of the same thing. It was written for a very different a smaller harp. harp. It also has a lot of five finger patterns in it because what's really funny is around that era, there was a a group of harpists that started experimenting with using all five fingers on the harp. Of course, it was a much smaller instrument, so that did work. At this point, um, to be able to fit the fifth finger on the harp, you'd have to really contort the hand and then you lose absolutely all of your strength. So any solution is better than using the fifth finger. Um, so that's kind of where the concerto just gets a little bit awkward. It's just also very pianistic, so it works great for the piano, but not quite so well harp-wise. But don't don't come get mad at me. I know some people <laughs> love it, and that's totally I'm fine. Mad at you. All the harpists out. No, all the harpists no. out there. No, not at all. No, the people who love it can play it, and I'll just play something else. And- no, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. I've never gotten to play that. But I mean, like flute and harp, I feel like are like we're kindred spirits. Like we're meant no, they, to play together. We're supposed they to be so teams. well together. But like if you know, so there's this piece that I have played before. I heard it at the National Flute Association Convention back in like early 2000s, um, put on by uh, the Kreutzen McGee duo. And the name of the piece is called Tahiki by Gareth Farr. 
and it is the most beautiful piece. And he's a New Zealand composer. And I would listen to this and I'm, you know, I'm, I had just gotten out of high school. I'm just fresh into college. I'm like, I have to play this. There's no way I can play this. I have to play this one day. And like, I took it to Florida state. I tried to play it for my master's and the professor there was like, I don't have anybody here who can play that. Like, what? It's my master's degree. Come on, man. I've been waiting like 10 years for this or whatever. She was like, sorry. <laughs> so I had to wait until later. Like I found somebody else who here in Nashville was able to do it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it is the most beautiful thing. And, but it makes me wonder like how many composers um, in our day and age, because Gareth Farr, I, he's still alive. I mean, he's not an old composer at all. It's like, how many composers have you come across that can really write for the harp how many of them play for the harp I mean or play for the harp play the harp you know what I'm saying I'm like how many of them actually know the idiosyncrasies of the instrument it's all the composers who actually are harpists themselves which there are a Mm -hmm. lot of them so most of the repertoire that gets performed was written for the harp by harpists which is great I don't have that skill I really admire you know harpists who can write um but Another thing I've always wanted to see just kind of the heart brought a little bit more into the mainstream where you know, composers who are you know doing all this exploration can also bring the harp into that. And in order to do that, you have to not be scared of writing for the harp. So that's my whole mission, just make the harp a little bit less intimidating. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, was I teach actually- a lot of courses and I teach a course on writing for the harp and, you know, if you're a composer, follow me on social media because I'm always sharing harp tips and stuff like that. And write for the harp. It's cool. Yeah, I was I was gonna comment a minute ago too. You're saying, you know, nobody really wants to write for the harp. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel like the harpists are kept in like not the same closet as the composers, but like right next door. Like the yeah. rest of us don't see you guys. <laughs> and it's like, true. Oh, Y'all are Why the unicorns. I was, in the the I was world. like doing all the things because I was like. <laughs> Yeah, harpists are great, but I want to actually interact with other people, meet other people. So I was like in all the theory classes and taking piano lit because I just like wanted to be around Ooh. other people. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, my poor professor. I was always just doing everything <laughs> I possibly could. It's, it's right. so true, though. When I was at Interlock and um, in a, as, a, as a camper, you could have uh, electives. And they're like, mm-hmm. do you want to take beginning string class or beginning brass? I'm like, no, I want to play the harp. And they're like, well, I'm sorry, that's full. Everybody wants to play the harp. Like, but, but, oh, man. So I had to learn to play the upright bass instead, which was awesome. <laughs> I, was <in> that <laughs> or, I was like, what is the farthest thing from flute I can get? Well, it's got to be harp. Well, harp is full. Well, if I can't do that, it's got to be I'm like, don't you want to play the cello? No, give me like the upright. The biggest instrument bass. I could possibly play. Yes, yes. Or the organ. That was second. But I was yeah. like, I don't have the much brain power to like deal with all of that. That's too many appendages. That's that's too close to like percussion. But I would I remember walking through the forest to get to like the practice huts and you'd walk past the heart building. And it's just like <laughs> you just wanted to cry because everybody wanted to be in there. It was most beautiful sounds coming out of there oh, like awesome. I have to go play this boat of an instrument <laughs> right <laughs> getting string class and it was literally made of metal and so we joked that it could be a canoe so like it literally could be because yeah it metal I mean it was it was pretty fun I'm not gonna lie and there was an organ player sat next like me and the organist so as a flute player and an organ player we were learning the bass and we had a ball nice. and I was like violin no but my first love was harp and so I learned to play harp in college Mm -hmm. because there was a it's funny I just had this conversation an hour ago with somebody my uh my college had a harp that just sat in a room nobody touched it nobody knew about that's so sad it bothered me and I was like no they cannot just sit here like I have to learn so I, I finally went to somebody I'm like Hey, what's the deal with this harp that's sitting here? Can I play it? And they're like, no. I'm like, why not? Nobody else is playing it. We didn't have any so harp not majors. A harpist. <laughs> right. And that's what they said. I'm like, well, if I take harp lessons, can I have the key? And they went, yeah. I'm like, done. Give me the key. So that's literally what happened. So I there's a, um, if anybody's here in Nashville, Mary Alice Hepfinger is her name. She played with the, uh, the Nashville Symphony for like ever and ever. Apparently, I didn't know this. And she was in Cookville with me. And she and I, maybe she doesn't want me to know this. I don't know. 
or want other people to know this, but we traded harp lessons for babysitting. Nice. And she came over to tech where I was having my undergraduate and I learned how to play harp. And I'm like, this is amazing. I like finally got to learn to play harp, but I never got to learn to play like lever harp or lap harp or any of that. It just, mm-hmm. it started on concert grand. So we just went full out. So unfortunately that's all I ever want, which, you know, I don't have 20, 40 grand to spend on one <laughs> my living room. Just but, the harp. It's amazing. It was such a nice break and to have that vibrate against your chest mm-hmm. and feel that it's so different than a woodwind instrument, which also vibrates in your hand, but it's very different to have that soundboard leaning against you. And there's just this beautiful connection with it that I, I miss. And I just think it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I, <laughs> I've, I, anytime there's a harp player in an orchestra that I play with, I have to go up and make friends. I'm like, hi, I love your instrument. I'm going to fangirl all over you. I'm (laughs) sorry. I'm not sorry. You know, I just think it's beautiful. And I wish there was more out there. So Mm -hmm. we're going to put in the show notes. um, If you haven't listened to our episodes with Hillary and Garrett, they're both composers. Mm -hmm. I know they would love to talk to you because they don't know. And they're living composers and they would love to write for the harp. I have a feeling. Could be wrong. But... (laughs) Yeah, that was a yeah, no, I've always, you know, composers just write for the harp. We like to do stuff. <laughs> Most of us are cool. Not all of us are cool, but I mean, a lot of us anything. are cool. That's anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I but think- I think the other thing that you had brought up when you were talking about that flute piece that was incredibly difficult, I think a mm-hmm. lot of the new music that's being composed is also incredibly difficult. Um which is fine because, you know, composers are writing for advanced musicians, but you also, there's younger students or amateurs or people who don't have 20 hours to learn a brand new piece. Um, Mm -hmm. So another thing I try to encourage composers to do is like write elementary or intermediate level music because it's so important to just like bring people into new music a little bit younger, like, you know, simplify it, introduce like one new thing, not 40 million yeah. crazy rhythms and extended techniques and yeah everything else you yeah. do one thing at a time and it's also yeah. nice for me like I do live stream concerts where I just play new music and the stuff I put on there is the stuff that is a little bit easier because I don't have time to learn a full program of crazy difficult music every month so it's the stuff that you know I could probably sight read and I have an absolute blast being able to play something and it sounds amazing the first time I play it. Like that's, that's so rewarding to do. So yeah. composers yeah. out there, right. It's okay to write music. That's not insane. Yeah. And, say it again for the people in the back. Yeah. Say it, say yeah. that again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Music that's not insane. <laughs> right. Right. That's no, what I, I learned when I was playing. It's like, it was good. It was easy to get started. It was very difficult to get good. Mm-hmm. There was like no middle ground. Intermediate right. music is so underrated. Like yes. I, I looked and looked and looked and I finally have a book that I love for my intermediate students just to teach them out of. I'm like, this is perfect. It's that beautiful transition. It sounds, it doesn't sound like an etude, you know, <laughs> right? it doesn't sound like I'm going to be learning this particular thing. No, it's, we're just going to slowly introduce you in the form of me. It's wonderful. And like you said, I mean, I know that a lot of, you know, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to, you know, play at this, um, event and just be the background music kind of kind of gigs um Mm -hmm. i know i knew for a long time okay this was always going to be something that you could pretty much sight read because it's just too much otherwise i Um, can't play four hours of crazy difficult right music right and i feel like and i feel like that was really driven home too uh in 2020 when all of a sudden there were all these online pop-up concerts and like well what are you gonna play you've got two weeks or a week and like you going to learn a concerto in that time? No, you're not. You're going to go, huh, what can I sight read? <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, there's, there's a lot of value in that. And it, just thinking about the crossover between that and lifting, mm-hmm. we focus on beginners and we focus on advanced lift, but the intermediates mm-hmm. get left out. Mm-hmm. I feel and right now like I I'm am, in, like totally. Right. Yeah. You too. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like I'm kind of like an intermediate like, I know, I know my stuff. I'm not lifting crazy heavy weights or anything, but. But you're also not a newbie, right? Right. I like, yeah. I know how to hold a barbell. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> that makes us very happy. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. But you think yeah. about it, you, you look at the programs that are out. They're either one or the other. We're either looking at crazy. I look on Instagram mm-hmm. and I see all these amazing variations that are just wild and stupid and crazy and like offloaded this and a thing and the one arm and okay. What's the progression from a bridge or I'm sorry, from like a basic dead bug mm-hmm. to a progressive dead bug. I've been teaching this the last week. I think I have taught this progression from a dead bug to a, a quote advanced intermediate dead bug mm-hmm. about seven times in the last week. I don't know why it's just come up a lot of times. It's like people just do the one thing and they think that's it. And then they have to do something crazy. I'm like, no, no, no. there's a progression and it's okay right. to progress. And personally, I just had this accident and I'm just now getting back into the gym after two and a half months of barely touching a weight because I'm afraid to grip because I had a broken thumb. And I'm still kind of iffy about the broken elbow. Like, ah, I don't know what I can mm-hmm. do. I don't want to re-break it. It's soft. There's ligament damage, whatnot, right? It looks fine. You can't see it. I can't see it. We don't know. So I'm back in that beginner intermediate stage. And I'm like, what do I do? That's not crazy advanced. That's not, can I push, if I can push five pounds with this and 15 pounds of that, well, how do I, there's all this middle ground. Right. And whether it's in music or lifting, it's like, this is an underserved population that is We're helping right people get from help. like the basics to the intermediate. It's like working up to a full push up or a full pull up. Like, oh yeah, you don't just like go do a pull up one day. And I'm you also don't just do a pull up or push up. Right. Like everyone talks about, you know, the knee push-ups, and then one day you're supposed to magically be able to do a push-up. Right. And that doesn't work. Achieve <laughs> <No. laughs> some stairs. Yeah. Once I started doing that, I was like, oh, now we're actually making clear, trackable progress. And wow. And I mean it actually works once you can actually track your stuff. That's why yeah, I love yeah. lifting, because you can see that progress. You're like, this week I can do one more rep at this weight. This week mm-hmm. I can add this much weight. And music is just like so arbitrary. Like I think right. this sounds better. I can play this a little faster, maybe. Yeah. But lifting is just like it's so clear. Right. Yeah. And, and what you're talking mentally about mentally restful in that way. Right. And what you're talking about too earlier um, with, you know, you you were an over practicer, mm-hmm. and then lifting kind of helped you tame that down. Um, I think that's something that we probably should talk about a little bit too. Cause I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's a, that's a being able to do something that's physically expressive, which is what I feel personally when I play my instrument, right? Like I don't communicate very well with most people. If I'm not talking about something I, I am confident about, right? Like if you, you want to, you want to talk to me about, you know, this, that, you know, like uh, health or fitness or music or strongman, I got you. You want to talk to me about like, I don't know the minutia of oceanography. I'm going to be like, I'll be in the corner. To see you guys. Like, yeah, just, no. just observing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so when you, for me to go back, um, music was always a way to physically express, you know, internal stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so not being able to do that, to the degree I wanted to because of injury or you you just, you only have so many hours of it in a day Mm. before you start pushing injury, which we've talked about too. Um, So being able to go into the gym where there are movements that you have to control. There are some movements where you don't, (laughs) you you just do. do. Mm -hmm. And as much as like, as hard as you like, you put sled push, go, go, go until you're dead. I don't care. Just move the thing um, to the other place. Right, right. Pick like it up not, and put it down over there. You're yeah. not going to hurt yourself on a sled push in an appropriate way. It's extremely unlikely. <laughs> so being able to have that outlet where it's like, I've got some pent up energy and I can't do this and I can't noodle anymore. I can't, I'm going to, something's going, okay, let me go. I'm going to push the sled. <sighs> I feel better. Okay. I can actually focus on things like, mental practice or score study, or maybe I'm back to ready to play, you know, that was a little bit of a rant. I relate to that so much. That's, it's all right. I mean, my practicing got so much more efficient Mm -hmm. once I had that outlet of lifting. Really? Say it again for the people in the back. (laughs) (laughs) 
like, listen to that. I'm a <laughs> player, y'all. Right, right. Because it's not about, you know, when you're at the gym, it's not about, I'm going to go deadlift for 30 minutes. And right. if it's less than 30 minutes, I didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's right. the way we do practicing. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to practice uh-huh. for 30 minutes. If it's less than 30 minutes, it didn't wasn't efficient. <laughs> Listen to this woman. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> that is so accurate because you wouldn't exactly. You would not say I'm going to deadlift for 30 minutes. Nobody does that. Right. But we do that with our instrument and we think we're less than. If I didn't practice for four hours today. I am not a legit musician. Mm-hmm. Oh, have mm-hmm. we talked about that ad nauseum. <laughs> Thank you for saying it again. People in the back heard at that time. <laughs> I think this is a great spot for us to take a break. We're going to be right back with Danielle Coons. Y'all stay, stay right here. Hey, musicians. Did you know that up to 90% of musicians will experience playing related pain or injury over the course of their career? How many hushed conversations have you heard about a lingering, quote, shoulder pain or a weird tingling in your fingers or maybe low back pain or a crampy weakness or... Maybe you or your colleague just says, I just have to get through the gig. And you watch them pop Advil like candy. Maybe flush it down with whiskey. How many times have we seen something like this? So many, right? Well, it's time we start talking about our struggles, our pain, our frustrations in a private space where we don't just complain and mobilize and blindly stretch, but we learn how to strengthen our muscles, our career successes, and build each other up. I've got a brand new program that combines all of these things, and I want you to be a part of it. It's a community, not a workout. It's a community with group coaching and great content that in 12 weeks will have you understanding more about your body, what you need, and how you work so you can avoid that career-threatening injury. The three things that musicians don't want. We don't want to be injured. We don't want to have a lack of stamina. And... We don't want to be clueless, a.k.a. when you hurt, who do you go see? Just a quote doctor? Well, this program addresses all of those things. You're going to walk away with an immense knowledge of who to see. You're going to be empowered because you're going to know what to do should you ever get injured or should you have a colleague that gets injured. You will be able to actually offer appropriate advice. You're also going to learn about the body and the anatomy as it relates to playing your instrument and your own anatomy. And then you're going to learn how to build not just your strength and endurance, but you're going to learn how to design your own corrective exercise program. So I hope you will join me in this new program. It's called the Music Strong Pilot Program, Job Security for Musicians. Welcome back to the Tune Dan Strong podcast with today's special guest, Danielle Kuntz. Um, we want to talk a little bit about, uh, in the time remaining, we want to talk a little bit about your event, um, the one with the cross collaboration between the composers and, and instrumentalists. Uh, so why don't you tell us about that, all the, all the nitty gritty details? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I do a ton of work with composers specifically on harp, but I always talk to all these other instrumentalists, like, no, I have these little pet peeves about, you know, writing for clarinet or writing for bassoon, writing for flute. And, you know, composers just don't get that opportunity because they take the instrumentation classes on writing for instruments, but you have to go through everything so quickly. Harp is in one day along with, you know, guitar and percussion usually. There's no way that you can get into enough detail on everything. Um, so what I'm trying to do um, is put together a conference, we're calling it Toolbox Sessions, to really connect composers, orchestrators, arrangers with experienced performers and collaborators who can really delve into all of these details. So we have a group of 12 presenters who are not only you know, performers, you know, high level performers, but they are the ones who are regularly working with composers know how to talk about all of this stuff. So it's going to be a three day event on that's all online makes life a little bit easier. Um, May 19th through the 21st. Um, so go ahead and mark your calendar. Um, we do have a website up or it will be by the time this episode is released um, toolbox sessions.com. We will have tickets available, but you could go ahead and just sign up for our mailing list and we'll send all that information to you. But would love to see you guys there. I'm so excited to be putting this together and just bringing you know performers and creating some more resources for composers to just have more confidence in writing. Yeah, yeah, and and so you said it's a three day event. Um, 
eight hour days, six hour days? What are you looking at? Do you know yet? Um, we don't know. Details, okay. <laughs> details coming soon. Yeah, we're, it's going to be like three to four presentations a day. So probably like three to four hours. Okay. And it's all, all going right. to be recorded. So there will be access to um, an on-demand library as That's well. That's good too. That's good. And too. is there a cost for this? There is. All those details still coming. Got it. Okay. No yeah. <laughs> we're, we are recording to be fair. Cause I know this is going to release, um, after we, re well, after we record this, but we are recording mid-March. So it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're listening uh, the day that it drops, uh, there's probably going to be more details. Hop onto the then. website because <laughs> a lot more details will be available. Toolboxsessions.com, guys. Toolbox Sessions, yeah. yep. Yeah. So if people want to know more about you and where they can find you, where else mm -hmm. can they find you, Danielle? Yeah, I am on all the socials, Danielle Kuntz Harp. Um, you can find all that information in the show notes. Um, it's Kuntz, K-U-N-T-Z. Um, so website, daniellekuntz.com or Instagram is probably where I'm the most active, but Twitter, Danielle K. Harp. Yeah, it's find me. Happy to talk. I post lots of harp tips and chats about new music, audience development, all that stuff. And we're going to have to have you back for a mm -hmm. part two, because during the break, you and I had a really brilliant Two yeah. second conversation that we should have recorded. <laughs> about, you know, there's so many crossovers between your know, fitness and music. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and things that have it. actually Honestly. been developed in the fitness world that musicians just we we just don't do, and we should absolutely, do. absolutely. So we're gonna I have to have on spoilers. Yes, we'll talk about that next time. Absolutely, and also how we can keep our orchestral audiences engaged oh, yes. new audiences coming so we had a fantastic mm -hmm. conversation i'm going to save this chat so we can start that the next part two because we have to have a part two to this oh, okay. yeah. we just got started <laughs> i look forward to it <laughs> danielle thank you well, thank you yeah, it's thank a pleasure to be here us. all right thank, thank you guys you. for joining us and um please don't forget to subscribe leave us a review if this was positive and don't forget to go follow danielle Give her a like, yeah. subscribe, a <laughs> review, a comment, because anytime you do that, it fosters this entire situation where we can reach more musicians. Right. Absolutely. All right. All Thank right. you for joining us. We'll see you next time.